Cuyahoga County Finance and Budgeting Committee meeting for Monday, January 28th, 2019 will please call, come to order. And I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Calling the roll, Mr. Miller? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Ms. Simon? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Shrine? Mr. Shrine is absent at the moment. Ms. Brown? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. We have a quorum. Also like the record to reflect that council members Conwell and Jones are also in attendance. Thank you very much for joining us. And the next item on the agenda is public comment. Has anybody signed in? No, Mr. Chair, no one has signed in. Okay, thank you very much. We have in your packets the minutes from the January 24th meeting. And if someone is ready, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So it's been moved and seconded. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The ayes have it. And the minutes for January 14, 2019 are approved. There are no matters referred to committee. Our primary item for today is our quarterly review of the Enterprise Resource Planning System. So I'd ask the administration to please come forward and start the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Michael Young, Department of IT. Okay, we have a lot of material to cover today, so I'll briefly go over the agenda and then we'll get right to it. Uh, today we'll have presentations from RSM, a brief presentation from Public Works. You'll hear from Fiscal and Payroll. You'll get a status of HR, which will include a demo of some of the products that we've delivered thus far, a budget update, and then we'll close with any additional questions that you may have. So I'd like to bring up um, Carrie from RSM to start the presentations. Okay. Welcome to the committee. Hi, I'm Carrie Sklenka Gordon. I'm a director at RSM. So uh, what we'd like to cover today is um, the approach that we've used in order to assess the ERP program. And what we'll first talk about is it's broken down into the different readiness assessments. Um, also talk a little bit about approach and a little bit about our status and next steps. So um, the scope that we've got for the third party assurance update is to assess overall uh, project governance and that is a one-time assessment that we do in the beginning, and it covers about 60 different factors around project governance to determine if those items are, are working and, and applicable. We also then look at testing. Um, so the testing readiness, integrated and user acceptance testing, organizational change management, and operational deployment as far as a readiness assessment. We share the results um, with the project drive PMO and the Executive Steering Committee meeting. The assessments cover... Uh, um, PMO, what is PMO? The, the Project Management Office. Okay. Okay. Assessments cover work stream solution deployments in um, the Enterprise Asset Management, or EAM, Human Resources, and Fiscal and Procurement. And then every one of our items will also uh, filter into the go, no-go decision matrix that were aligned with the Steering Committee. And the matrix aligns with, um, again, all the elements that we ad identify or address in any of our assessments. And then um, the items would be discussed in those meetings and um, the uh, project team determines what to do with the items as far as any closure. Any questions on that to date? Please continue. So I think we'll let you... Uh, Complete your presentation and then we'll have questions. Okay, thank you. So uh, we partner with the Project Drive leadership and team members um, in doing the assessments and the assessments are done with a very um, strict um, checklist that has all the items we look at when doing these. And we look at um, observations. We Any observations we have, we obtain any evidence or supporting evidence that supports the observations and discuss the issues that we've identified uh, with associated risk ratings with the uh, PMO project drive. We attend various work stream meetings, um, not all but many. 
Um, we've uh, commented that they are well run. Uh, they follow published agenda, um, assign follow-up and various actions uh, with whatever items come up. Discussions followed on project management constraints of, of time and, and people has been identified. Um, there is definitely still a, um, a, there's a sense of urgency that is brought into any one of the issues that are identified um, to escalate upward as well as plans in order to make sure that uh, the items are resolved. Um, the requirements have lockdown dates assigned to them. And then at the outset of the engagement, um, you know, we've noted that the more we've noted that there's been an increase in PMO support than there was when we had first started, which is some of the result of some of the governance assessments we've done. So we've definitely seen an improvement within the project based on some of the assessments. And what is OCM? Organizational change management. Mm, okay. And then lastly, um, for an update, you know, we started in about the May timeframe. Um, so within that, we've been able to assess the fiscal and procurement work streams, which cover accounts payable, uh, procurement, uh, the SCM solutions. We've done um, IST readiness assessments. Uh, uh, draft had been submitted. Um, issues identified to date um, have been completed. And um, We've looked at organizational change management as well as operational deployment. Um, the, also, we've covered the pay, payroll works and workforce management solutions um, as far as just uh, IST being prepared in February. So as the project continues to roll out, we're staying along with the project lockstep. Okay. Any questions by my colleagues for RSM? Well, uh, I have a few. Okay. Uh, one is that I know that uh, that accounts payable was delayed and then was rescheduled for February 1st, which is just a couple days from now. Have you made an assessment of, of whether we're ready to go, go live on February 1st on General Ledger? Not yet, not according to where our scope of testing is. Are you saying you, you haven't made an assessment or we're not ready? We haven't made an assessment yet, correct. And when will that assessment be done? Um, early February. It, maybe I don't understand something. It would seem to me that the readiness assessment would be completed before the go-live date. Mm -hmm. So, so that uh, the assessment can be used to help determine whether whether we're ready to go live, and if if not, there's uh, can would I there would there be things that could be done before the date to fix the problems? Why would it not? Why would it be done after February first? Can I get back to you on answering that to double check our timing of that specific assessment? Okay. Uh, have you done any assessments on uh, on our readiness to to proceed on on the uh, the re remaining financial item go lives that are are scheduled for later in this year? We will be doing uh, additional assessments, um, as we've mentioned, we'll start picking up here in January, February again. So as the, the project goes through the various phases, we would do the various assessments. So when the project is ready for us to do the testing assessment, we jump into the testing assessment. So this has been an in and out. It's not like a project where we're in assessing every single week. It goes along with the um, timing of the project and the various tasks that they're doing. In addition to the specific question on general ledger, I would also have a question as to why these assessments are not being done at an earlier stage prior to the scheduled go live date so that if problems are discovered, there, there would be time to fix the problems. Yep. Yep. And I can answer that, that to date, we have been making sure, again, we are doing the assessment when the project team is ready for us to be able to do the assessment. 
So if there's some, like if testing is, is at the point of IST or UAT, then we're able to do the assessment. We're not able to test something or do an assessment of something that isn't completed. So to date, we have been actually getting all the assessments done um, well in advance before any of the go-lives. That gives the project team time to remediate anything. And uh, does your consulting process uh, involve anything that you do uh, prior to this final testing stage for each of the go live elements, uh, anything that would would flag potential problems at an earlier point in the process? Sure, I mean, um, the organizational readiness would identify anything, the pre-deployment readiness would identify any major potential problems, again, within that scope, yes. Are there current organizational readiness problems that are out there that you've identified? I believe there's a couple that have been identified, but they have been, um, they're being worked on through the project team. I don't have could, that list on me. Could you tell us what those are? I don't, yeah, I don't have the list on me, I'm sorry. I can get, I can get you that information. I would appreciate it. Sure. Any other questions, uh, Councilman Gallagher? I just have a concern. We're, and I don't know if you can in your capacity do this, but we're having all done, all in September 2019. Are we still online for that? I believe so. For what we have seen today, again, you know, our, our scope is limited to testing, organizational readiness, deployment, and governance. And for each work stream, it is done individually at the time the work stream is ready for us to do the assessment. So there are some, again, there are some things we haven't assessed yet because the project team isn't there yet in the project. Mm -hmm. There's several different work streams going on simultaneously. Have you done many of these in your career? I've done about 39 assessments. I'm just not in, in these. In ERPs? Yeah, uh-huh, 39. Mm -hmm. is, is this typical? Um, with a complex uh, ERP all, they're implementation. They're all complex. With an ERP implementation along with a, a business transformation, which is also going on, yeah. Um, it, it, these, um, this is very real, very normal stuff that we identify. It happens in almost all of them. Mm -hmm. have, you, have, you, have you had an organization that had only segments of the organization participate in the ERP? Um, like we don't have the courts or the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Seems to be odd that you would cut out almost half of everything that you deal with. So again, I can't comment on that, but what I can say is there are business process leaders and they are, they are identified in this. So we have not been um, asked to assess any level of who is involved and who isn't. All I can say is from a project governance, there are mm -hmm. leaders in each one of the areas that are involved in each of the steering committee meetings. So anything like that would roll up to those leaders. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, typically they're known as um, global business leaders, GPOs, but it's the same. It's the Thank same you. level. Miss mm -hmm. Baker. Um, just curious, the deadline that was supposed to be met by the 1st of January, I believe it's for the payroll or payables, and now we're looking to February. Did you know that we were going to miss that deadline in January? Did you assess back in December that this is on a track where there's no way that this can be done by January? Not based on the assessment that we would have done mm -mm, and what we covered. Mm -mm. And just to continue, um, why why not? Why it's, wouldn't you, it be, it, given you're assessing mm -hmm. you know, all the benchmarks, yep. why wouldn't that have been a benchmark that wouldn't have been identified? Yeah, that was, um, again, it was in November and it was two months out, so there were issues identified, but then the project team takes those issues back and would remediate whatever would, that would be up to the project team. So from our, from our assessment, nothing major, no major red flags were identified, um, you know, to, that would say that there would be a significant delay. Just to follow, so now that the deadline's been moved to February 1st, there's no significant flags, in your opinion, 
that you see not being uh, completed by February 1st? Again, I would need to get back to you on that. So my team is is um, managing or assessing these online. I'm, I came up to help with today, so, so I can get you back to that. Thank you. Yeah. Councilman Tuma. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I got a, just a quick question for you. So as far as the assessments go, um, who who is setting the deadlines? Are they like the, the departments that are working on the ERP and before you do the assessment? Or is it you guys set a, a date together uh, as to when it might be mm -hmm. obtainable? How does it work? Yeah, so we look at the project plan. Um, and the project plan obviously is kept up to date with any, any changes that occur from beginning to go live. And we interact um, weekly to determine what would be the best timing for us to come in to be able to assess something, like when will they be at a point that things will be ready to assess. Because you don't want to come in and have nothing to assess. Sure. So, do you, but do you guys, you know, um, as far as timeliness, I guess, I'm mm -hmm. looking at, do you guys, you know, recommend, hey, you should be further along on, on something or you, get, you should be getting this done because we have a deadline, a set deadline coming up. Do you guys play that role or do you kind of let the department heads dictate to you when they're ready? I guess that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, it's more the department heads when they're ready for us to come in and do the assessment. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Afternoon, mem afternoon, members of council. Michael Dever, Department of Public Works. Okay, I um, I'm giving a brief overview of the EAM or the work order, workforce or work order system that has been uh, we've uh, we've gone into production support mode now with it. So um, on page eight of the uh, presentation. So that means the installation is done. It's completed, yes. Okay. Um, we're still waiting um, uh, for the other modules to come into play here, which will be the workforce management, procurement, and the payroll, which uh, the timeline for those, they're, um, uh, I think those are before you already. I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, June and July are two of those items. Procure, the proc procurement item, I think, is in in July, and then the workforce management is in June, if I'm correct. We'll yep, we will cover that in a few minutes. Um, so the project's going fairly, fairly well, and I'll show you some numbers when we get to the next slide of where we are. Um, we're in the process of actually looking to expand and add more tablets for people in the field to utilize that are inputting and, and utilizing the work order system. Um, we haven't come up with an exact additional number yet, but um, we're looking to add more into the field. We cr currently have 80 of them in the field with our personnel. Um, we're also reviewing and prioritizing new functionality to be added to the system. Um, so the, the project overall is going very well. Um, the next slide here shows currently what um, work orders were generated just in the month of January as of last Friday. We were just under 4,000 and over the weekend and into Monday here, we just added another 185 work orders. So we're capturing all the information that's going on uh, within our facilities, um, our sewer projects, uh, road and bridge, print shop. So, um, it's, uh, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's going very, very well. So with that, I'm, I'm here to answer any of your questions. Okay, seeing none, we thank you. We appreciate the success. The uh, problems we have are elsewhere. Keep thank up you. the good work. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, let me let me just alleviate some confusion over the RSM uh, discussion that occurred previously. Uh, first of all, I'm Jack Ryan. I'm the project manager for the financial ERP modules. Uh, so I, I think the confusion might have arisen from the maybe the 
confusion over the question. Uh, the initial question, I think, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, the initial question was, was the coverage for accounts payable and the fact that accounts payable had slipped from, um, I guess, January uh, out to February. And accounts payable was never scheduled for then. Uh, we'll cover the schedule in detail here. So what is what was scheduled for the first part of, uh, of uh, January originally that has slipped out, and we'll talk about that, was uh, general ledger, uh, project accounting, and what's called flexible budgets, okay? Uh, we did not ask RSM to actually evaluate general ledger. Uh, what they have been evaluating, the focus was really, because that was, a, you know, in some respects, uh, a simpler from a project management point of view, that was a somewhat simpler component of the project, uh, although we had some challenges in, in, that we'll talk about there. We were, we're through most of that. What we did ask them to focus on was the, was the April-May time block, which is much more complex. It involves, you know, close to 500 people, uh, lots of moving parts, lots of OCM required, and that was the, that's really what their slide deck referred to, was the, was the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, we wanted focus on procurement, on accounts payable, uh, uh, the, those things involve other things, uh, you know, involve other agencies across the board. Uh, so, so that's where that's where RSM's assessment focus has been, and they are doing that well in advance of those dates. That's been they've we've had the first discussions with them on those subjects, and that's what the results were on the slide. And uh, we'll have further discussion with RSM as we clean up uh, some of the things that they found, and as we get more prepared. So. Let me just, with that opening statement, just to try to alleviate that confusion, let me take any questions on, on that. Okay. Does that help? That does. Thank okay. you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, at several people's suggestion here, what we've tried to do is present a, a more global um, uh, view of the, of the program across the board. So the slide that you're looking at to begin with uh, is taken directly from a Microsoft project plan that covers the entire program or all the remaining activities of the program. Does not include the uh, public works uh, stuff that Mike has just reported on uh, since that's, that's passed, but it does report activities that have taken place uh, over the last 30, 40 days and into the future, okay? And what, what that tells you is that, that overall, from an overall program perspective, all the modules that are remaining to be delivered we're sitting at about 40%, 48% complete. And you can kind of see the breakdown, breakdown by module in, uh, in the slide deck, okay? Any questions on that to begin with? Just as an opening thought, okay? Um, it's worthy to, I, I think at this point, just to, 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 locate, to, to identify what you know, what has our team accomplished? What are some key things? I, I just picked out eight things that, are, that I think are worth talking about. Uh, one, of, you know, one of those things is we're in the final stages of implementing those three modules that we just talked about. General ledger, project accounting, uh, flexible budgeting. I, I don't think I emphasized the fact that there's three modules, not just one module that was going live, originally scheduled for January. But there are three, and it was significant effort on both fiscal and OBM's part to get to that point. Uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, we, we evaluated the, the N4 to EPM module. We went all the way through an integrated systems test for that, found that it was not going to meet our requirements. We've partnered with N4, uh, who's come back with a, what was a third-party solution, which is now incorporated into their solution set called Sherpa uh, Budget Formulation and Management which has been, uh, is a proven product. Uh, uh, we've interviewed several other uh, organizations that have used it. We've seen demonstrations of it. Uh, it's now, it now can be acquired directly through Infor. And we currently have a zero dollar change order that we're waiting to be finalized, uh, which would take us down the path of using the Sherpa BFM product. Uh, uh, we've already got a, a, a tentative or a proposed implementation plan of about 65 work days. So as soon as we can get this through the change order process and get started, that 65 day clock will start to run. And we've incorporated that into our project planning as well. Um, 
And right now, you know, based on a six, that 65-day clock, uh, making an estimate of when we hope to get it through the, the county process and get the change order reviewed, it would probably be an, a May implementation. Uh, we would have liked to have done April, but uh, right now May looks like it's more likely. The good news is it's an excellent product. Uh, Maggie and her folks have looked at this in detail, very satisfied that it would, that it would meet the requirements, and uh, we're excited about getting started. So that decision is a, is a major sort of landmark milestone. The when, other was, thing, when was DEPM yeah. originally scheduled for? DEPM was originally scheduled uh, to go live in January along with General Ledger, mm -hmm. or, or shortly thereafter. It was going to be two, three weeks after that. Uh, when it failed IST, uh, it failed to meet the requirements, and it was obvious that, and that's why we have testing, mm -hmm. we, we looked at it and failed it, uh, then we began the process of replanning. So it's been a pretty rapid replanning and, and, and uh, you know, process to get this in, into the project plan to get it moving. So I'm, I'm very hopeful with what we have. Okay. All right, business intelligence. We're, we're implementing at this point just one sort of BI module, if you will. Uh, but it's an important one. Uh, every single person on the uh, OBM and uh, fiscal team has a copy of uh, what's called this MS Excel add-ins product, which allows you to reach inside of the, uh, of the tables that make up uh, the loss and financial system and pull data, uh, analyze it, create your own reports, Basically, do anything you can do in Excel, but do it by, by pulling data out of, out of the system and being able to manipulate it. So that's actually been successfully installed across the board on everybody's computer in those uh, departments. One of the, the next item, <clears throat> item four there, is an important one. What we, what we came to realize uh, as part of our implementation here, one of the things that caused us to slide our schedule was that the security model that we originally uh, had in place that, that allows user access to different screens uh, in different parts of the system really was not as flexible as we thought it needed to be uh, going forward. It would have been uh, a night, quite honestly, in the, in the words of our IT staff, a nightmare to maintain. So, and it was 55,000 lines of, of information long. So, we've gone through a process of uh, restructuring that to meet the county's needs. Uh, the county IT staff has taken ownership of that process, and uh, we now have a model that uh, uh, has been reviewed by DIA uh, multiple times, reviewed by our staff multiple times, and uh, is actually the one that's going to be going into production. It's actually in the process of being uploaded to the production environment today. So that was a... That was a uh, process that we hadn't anticipated uh, having the problems we had with the security model, but we're very satisfied with the results, and it'll be something very easy, easy to maintain going forward. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also have a process in place, a formal process for user access approval and change uh, in place. Uh, that was uh, one of those audit findings that needed to be taken care of along with the security model. We had both those, uh, both the, the process and the model, like I said, heavily reviewed by DAA, heavily reviewed internally. We're satisfied with that model. The important piece of that also is that, that the approach or the methodology we used in that restructuring of the model uh, is the methodology that we're going to use going forward. So we've set the stage for all the other financial models uh, or modules that are going to be implemented in Lawson. So we don't have to redo that every time. We're going to use the same methodology going forward. And who is DIA? I, uh, Department of Internal Audit. Oh, okay. Okay, Corey and, and Kim and, and the rest okay, of the that group. Okay. Yes, sir. Sorry for the acronyms. Okay. Too much time in the military, apparently. So. All right, uh, the, the fifth item, uh, <clears throat> just honorable mention here uh, for the fiscal and OBM teams. Uh, uh, I've got a slide, the next one up, that we'll look at that just talks about, just give you an idea of the level of effort here. Uh, yeah, we, we've slipped the G, those, those three module implementations into February for good reasons. The first and foremost thing here is do it right, okay, uh, and we're doing that. But you know, 
That team has been doing this simultaneously while closing the 2018 books in finance. <clears throat> OBM has been validating all of the budget balances and making sure that everything is aligned with, you know, the past two years worth of council resolutions and budgets, uh, actually all, all the way back to starting points in 2016 in some cases. So there's really been yeoman's work done by that team. And I just wanted to recognize them and shout out to them in, in a public forum uh, for that effort. <clears throat> the uh, workforce management effort is underway. The testing is underway. Uh, this is, uh, you recall from, I think, a previous meeting, we had some stats out there about how many different rules mm -hmm. were involved in, uh, uh, for all 38 CBAs and four employee handbooks that the county has in place. And all of that testing is underway right now. They've, of, they, they're doing this in three iterations. The first uh, of those iterations has just been completed and they're working on defect resolution for what they found there. It's also one of the most complex ones because it's the one that involves actual hands-on programming as opposed to just configuration. So all that's underway uh, at this point in time. So that's a major accomplishment to get that to the point where the design's done and the testing is underway. The procurement future state vision, um, that is not just requisitions and purchase orders, which we, we have going live next, but also all the way out to include contracting and uh, contract management and strategic sourcing. That vision and that basic design, that flow, has been completely laid out. Um, al along with exactly how we're going to transition uh, pieces of the procurement process over long term. Uh, the goals here have not changed, uh, but just to restate them, all requisition and purchasing is going to be done in Infor. Uh, the, uh, the exceptions to what stays in on base are the handoff to agenda manager for items that, that need council attention, and uh, the uh, document storage, which will still take place for as the uh, document storage of record for documents associated with those, pro those procurement transactions. So uh, by the time we get to August, even the 50123 reporting, which is where a lot of the status for procurements and contracts comes from, will be done primarily out of INFOR at that point. So we will have moved the all of the procurement uh, and uh, process and its controls and its reporting into INFOR by the time we get to August. Okay. Last but not least, uh, uh, the implementation of, of financials and general ledger required a complete restructuring of the chart of accounts. It's a major undertaking uh, and done in conjunction with, with uh, internal audit, external auditors, uh, internal work by, by the controller, uh, by Amy and Angie in the, in the fiscal department. And, uh, you know, just a recognition that not only has the conversion been done, but Infor has also helped provide us with a conversion tool, all of which, all of that information, the chart itself, the conversion tool, so you can make them, so somebody coming in can make a map, you know, easily determine what famous account relates to which Infor account going forward, because that's going to be very important for other agencies as well as internally. All that stuff is, is about to be released here. Uh, it's in use in, in the current general ledger. It'll be released broader to other agencies uh, going forward here very shortly. So that's just some of the things that they've accomplished. Some interesting statistics related to that. There is, uh, this, this go live in February involves over 30 people on staff for fiscal and OBM. Uh, the conversion process alone, uh, 58, 58 individual conversion files um, required for this go live. Uh, each of those had to be touched multiple times. So essentially you're doing 400 individual file validation cycles. Okay, to get this done, it's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, not exactly from a pure accounting standpoint, but it's sort of like, and we're doing two years worth of history, sort of like doing 24 back-to-back month-end closings uh, and making sure that everything ties. So that gives you an, an idea of the level of effort required from a, <clears throat> from a uh, financial point of view and staff point of view. It meant that the team has uh, had, over the last four months, 100 different coordination meetings 
80, 8.30 a.m. stand-up meetings. You can only have so many stand-up meetings for, with me at 8.30 in the morning before you get tired, I think. So, um, you know, to their credit, they saw this all the way through the end, right? Uh, for testing, there's 120 testing scripts run multiple times, so there was over 500 individual tests run against what you see in General Ledger. That security model I was talking about, that, that meant that uh, both the, by the time you combine the original 55,000 line model and then the revised model, there are over 99,000 lines of individual security entries, meaning Joe Smith gets access to this kind of a screen on, you know, to allow this kind of access, okay, those kinds of things, one line for every one of those. Um, by the time you add those all up, it's, all, it's almost 100,000 things that somebody has to review. Why did that take an extra month? Because there's 100,000 things that somebody has to review, and they, they better get them right, okay, to make sure we meet all the audit requirements. Um, I already mentioned the chart of accounts current tracking tools that we have in place. I know that was a subject of discussion in a previous council presentation here. We've got a, an extensive Microsoft project plan that ties all of this together. Um, it's uh, right now sitting at 1,470 key activities um, and uh, was used to different charts in this presentation are pulled directly from that. We also do issue tracking in SharePoint. There's 232 issues. 220 individual technical objects that are being tracked, and I'd already mentioned in a previous meeting, we're also tracking all of the original requirements against that, some 37 and 163 original requirements in the so-called requirements traceability matrix, okay? So that's it's a little bit about the statistics of what makes up what the team's been doing. Questions? Anyway. Please proceed. Yes, sir. Um, upcoming activities, uh, we've already mentioned some of these here, but uh, our go-live, our official go-live date uh, is February the 11th, okay? We, we pushed it off to the 11th uh, primarily so we could make sure that all the training was done, the security model was in, final validation was done, we just put a bow on it. Um, no disadvantage to February 1st versus February the 11th. There's a lot of advantages in just making sure that everything's done correctly and we turn it up at that point in time, okay? Uh, beginning implementation of the, of the Sherpa solution just as quickly as we can. I already mentioned that as an up upcoming activity and we're currently preparing for IST, uh, in integration systems test and user exceptions testing. Uh, extensive versions of that for, for procurement, for accounts payable, and for cash and treasury management. Uh, you can see this, I'm not going to go through the details of the schedule that's provided for you underneath that. That was pulled directly from Microsoft Project as well. But it gives you an idea of the activity coming up. And what... When does the next go live take place after the one that's scheduled for GL and the other two things on February 11th? Yes, sir. I'm going to I'm going to get to that in just in just a moment. Okay. 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 Let's see here. What am I doing? Any other questions on uh, on this slide? Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. On the um, yes, ma'am. Get the language right here. On the general ledger project accounting and flexible budgeting that was delayed till February 11th that yes, we thought was going to be starting in January, does that delay other parts of how it's interconnected with other go live and I mean how does that not push everything else off those same amount of days? It, it pushes some things off and I'm going to cover that in detail here in just in just a moment. There, okay. is, there is some connectivity, not to everything, but to some things. Okay. All right, and I'll then, wait then. Thank if you. you. Could give me just a moment and I'll, I'll get there. Uh, just a, a, a little bit of an aside. I talked to the team about mountain climbing. Uh, mountain climbing is my hobby, has been since I was like 11 years old growing up in Portland, Oregon on Mount Hood. That happens to be a picture of Mount Hood. <laughs> and uh, there's a tendency when you, when you see lots of confusion out there, like this, the mountain on the left. They're both the same mountain, by the way, okay? <laughs> Um, the mountain on the left there, which you see is lots of clouds, lots of activity. That's actually a picture of my wife in the parking lot before we get ready to go climb Mount Hood. Uh, you wouldn't tell that from the wonderful uh, 
uh, clo uh, you know, clothing we've got on there. So you look at that and you go, oh my God. And I've been asked this question as a climb leader. I've led climbs since I was a young kid, I guess. And you have people turn around to you, they look at the mountain, they see nothing but clouds, and you see a whiteout where you really can't see up or down. And you're standing there out just outside the parking lot getting ready to go, and everybody says, my God, what are we doing here? You can't even see the top. We should cancel right now. And uh, I think there's a tendency to do that sometimes. Uh, and uh, we have to remember that the same mountain, it's the same mountain in both pictures there. What's the difference? You know, the one on the right, the clouds aren't there. You can see the top. You wouldn't have a problem taking off in that weather. So do you not take off and do the climb because of bad weather? My experience has been you almost always go, unless it's just horrendous weather. And what oftentimes what you find is when you clear about 9,000 feet on the mountain, you break out into cloud, out of the clouds into clear sky. That probably happens 80% of the time. So what's the lesson there? Don't cancel in the parking lot is the first thing. And the second thing is this, just because you can't see the, the top or the end doesn't mean it's not there, okay? It's the same mountain, the top didn't move. Uh, we can still get there. We just need to keep moving and stay focused on, on making sure that we do, do the jobs that we're, we're called to do there. The third thing is that clouds will always be there, right? We're always gonna have clouds. You're always gonna be uncertainty, if you will. Um, but they always clear, eventually, if you, especially if you keep going, they always clear. Weather will change. And the, the last thing is that, interestingly enough, the closer you get to the top, the harder it is to see the summit. I've had that experience before. You know, where you, and we've all, you know, as you come to the top of a hill, you can't see the top of the hill. The guy climbing on the left-hand side doing the ice fall down there, doing the ice climbing, I've done that before. You really can't see anything except the two feet in front of you. And that's kind of where, that's usually where the staff's at as they're working through a project. We're down there taking, you know, one piton, one step at a time, moving up that wall. And, uh, and sometimes until you break out of that, you can't see the top. So just because we have some delay, I guess my message out of that, or we slip something so we can do it right, you know, we don't want to fall off the mountain. That's not our objective here. We want to get to the top safely, and then we want to come back home. So let's, let's not give up in the parking lot, and let's not give up just because, you know, it took us a little longer to get to the top, Okay. Sorry for the philosophical diversion here, but it's but it but it there's a lot of similarities there. Can I ask you a question? At this point, or you want him to finish? Yes. Uh, no. Oh, go ahead. Okay, yes, ma'am. So this is just the Sherpa analogy team. Did you name the team Sherpa from the Sherpas? That oh no, that, that's, that's, that's the company really, name. That's a company. By the way. Okay, <laughs> I just wondered. Okay, that's not really my question. It's a great simile. I love the name. No, but, I, but I didn't come up with the, the name, mountain so. analogy. It's right there. But why? Why keep giving us deadlines that can't be met? Instead of giving us a broader range, knowing all of this that you just presented to us, right. the intricacies, the massive um, technicalities, instead of setting the team up perhaps when they come before us to say we can't meet these goals in retrospect, why, why not just be more realistic on the front end? Well, you know, first of all, sometimes, you know, despite our best science, you know, when I came before you before, I gave you the best dates that we had based on the data that we had, okay? I, and, and we set those dates, you know. The schedule that we had in front of us, we, you know, we put out, were we back together, uh, October? July, October, something. So that was, that was our best information at that time. As we've learned a little bit more, and, and been able to plan a little bit more in detail, we've, we've adjusted some of those dates. And to your point, let me just, let's, let's speak to that. So, uh, because we need to be as realistic as we can. So I'm not trying to dodge the question at all. Quite the contrary, I'd like to address it directly here. As we, we the January, what used to say just January says January, February, because obviously we've moved that one. We talked about that. What about this block in, in April? So the April-May block uh, of activities, we, we want to move to May because we think that is more realistic, okay? Um, and there's, it, the reality is that the, the, uh, the general ledger, uh, flexible budget, the project accounting piece, it moved about two and a half weeks, but what would have happened was we, that would have put us sort of in the middle of April, which doesn't make sense for, a, for an accounting cutover. 
Uh, it, also, it, it makes sense more at month end, for one thing. Second thing is we think it's going to take more time to try to get out and finish the communication to all the other agencies and the 400 and some people involved. You know, the go live we just finished is, you know, it's 30 people kind of all in the same building here, all, all on the same floor for the most part. Um, we start moving outside of that to, four, I think it's 430 people in other agencies plus the internal staff uh, for OBM and that group. Uh, now we've got 500 people we're dealing with. It just, it's going to take more time. So we are moving that. Uh, per, per this uh, conversation, at least, moving that out to the first part of May, okay? Now, the question, the question that that begs is the next, the next chart over in the May, what was the, the June time frame, May-June time frame, is that, does that need to move and what's the impact of that, okay? Um, there, we're still looking at that. You know, I think I, I'd say we're reviewing the impact uh, to see whether we actually think that's going to move. I don't want to move it unless we have to, okay? I don't want to move the target unless we absolutely have to. But if we have to, we have the flexibility to move that in. We could go all the way into June without affecting really anything downstream of that. Uh, and it would be, I don't have numbers in front of me. There are obviously, anytime we move something, there's the likelihood we'll get a change order uh, out of that to do something. But it would, that would be a relatively minor uh, compared to the overall cost of the project kind of shift versus a major shift. So I'm not nervous about it. We need to announce that enough ahead of time so we're not driving everybody nuts around us on the project team. I agree with that. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to move the target just to move the target because we're afraid. Just because I see clouds doesn't mean we're canceling the climb, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, if the weather looks severe enough, at that point we'll make the call, okay? So we'll try to do that far enough in advance so that we don't, uh, we don't alarm everybody. But the fact of the matter is, the way we built the plan, we had some flex. I hate to use the word slack time, which is the project management term for that. But we have some flex to move out a month and, and not dramatically hurt ourselves. OK? Does that help? OK. Councilman Gallagher. Yes, sir. Our, our, our concerns, I think, as you, as you know, are this Everything kept getting kick, kick, kick. You came in probably halfway through, which we're really grateful to see. But to go to your analogy is, you know, we're the mountain on the left. It's even worse. And our and our our guide is no longer here. So, do you send those people up the mountain without a guide in bad weather? I'm not sure which guide is not here. The, you, the guide, the guide. You said the leader. Oh, 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 okay. The team leader. Yes. Mysteriously has to be removed. Do you go up that mountain with all the all the trouble of brew, or do you just plow ahead without a leader? Well, I'm not sure what the question is. If the question is, am you I going to be the removed? Analogy that that you don't stop regardless of the weather and, and don't stop in the parking lot. Okay. Our guy got picked up in the parking lot and removed. We're, we're, we were helm we were without someone you know, driving the car. Yeah. And that's, that's our, our trepidation here is we, we hear things, they don't come true, it's kicked, even if it's a week or a month, we're, we're, we're nervous about okay. that. There, we, we do see progress here, and we're hopeful that finally we could get to the end of this, but we're skeptical. Okay, I, and I appreciate the skepticism, sir, I do. I, um, you, know, what I, you know, if you looked at the accomplishments to date and look at where we are with the, you know, some of those things related to general ledger, the security model, all the work that's been done, clearly uh, the team has performed. So if I want to base uh, you know, part of that prediction about getting to the top, if I want to base that on what I think the team has done and what they're capable of doing, I think they've proven themselves to be capable of digging in and keeping going and seeing something through to the end. And I think that's worth a lot. Right. Um, have we allowed, the real question is, have we allowed enough time uh, to get through each of these processes? Back to, back to Ms. Simon's question. And, and we're doing our best to make sure that we've allocated that kind of time. And you can see that the right. way we're looking at this schedule right now. Which has been our concern all along. That Sure. You know, we're, 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 we always say it. I'll say it again. We're not here to be a hindrance. We're here to be a help. Yes, sir. That's not always taken for what it is, and that's fine. We, don't, we can't force what, what we don't know on you. When you showed up, it was, I was great, grateful for you even being here. 
uh, and I, in what you're taking part in, I can see the movement. So hopefully we use your skills throughout until we are yes, into sir. that September. Well, what I, you know, again, I, what, I, what I said to you the very first time I stood before this body, I think I said, you know, I, wanted to, I didn't say it quite this way, but I want to be three things. I want to be transparent with you. Uh, I want to be truthful, uh, you know, the whole truth, you know, both. I don't want any, any lies by omission or commission, uh, you know, either one. And I want to be trustworthy with what, uh, what you guys have entrusted me to do here. We, and so we we're greatly, trying to do that. To we best greatly of our ability. appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. There was a yes, sir. There, there was a line in the uh, in the last administration report, and and it uh, it expressed concern about having to restart the planning process for CTM and CB after a loss of both the N4 lead and the county lead in this area. Could right. you elaborate on that? Who those who those leads were and what these. Uh, these elements are and, and what's happening with that? Sure. Uh, there was a gentleman in cash and treasury uh, in that department, in Chris's department there, that, that uh, uh, departed the county, um, and uh, he was carrying quite a bit of the load for that. Uh, and uh, so what that, that was one of the two things here. The other part of that was the N4 team lead, uh, because we were, this is going back a ways, because we weren't working the CTM project, uh, he was reassigned to another project. So what's happened with, in both of those cases, to address them both, the N4 team lead is actually back. First part of February, he'll be here full time, uh, engaged on the project. So that hole got filled here. We temporarily sort of worked through that uh, till he was back available. And uh, the cash, you know, treasury, cash and treasury, uh, 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 there, that while they haven't replaced that person, we're working with that team. Uh, they've identified people to take responsibility in those areas, so we're working through that with them. Is there a hole there still in that area? Sure. Uh, anytime you miss somebody that's that, or somebody leaves that that's a key player, uh, it's going to create uh, some churn. But uh, but I think we're in a position to work through that, and we have, you know, there's uh, on the cash and treasury front, uh, there's. Uh, even in the absence of uh, the N4 team lead being full-time with us, he's been working, uh, that person has been working uh, after hours and, and has actually got most of the, uh, for example, scripts are one of the big things we have to have for an, for an IST coming up, uh, integrated system test. Uh, a lot of that stuff is ready to go. And we're now, we're now just working through what the data requirements are to get ready for an IST. We also pushed the IST out a bit to account for the, fat, the shift in people. So we've done some mitigating things to make sure that we can get this done. And what is CB? Oh, uh, uh, cash book. It's all part of okay. cash and treasury management. It's a sub-module, I guess, is the way you could look at that, to that area. The managed okay. cash coming in and out. Okay? Okay, please continue. Yes, sir. So um, the, um, the other part of this uh, uh, slide here is that you, you'll not, there's not a direct, I specifically make the statement here, there's not a direct connection between moving the May-June activities and automatically forcing a move of the July activities. Those are not connected. Those are two different tracks. Although the arrow kind of points that direction, I just want to be clear about that. Those are different groups of people, and those are different, different parts of the product. Okay. What is, uh, and I'll talk about this when I get to risks here in a minute, what, what is a concern is making sure that we have uh, the GHR data that we need in place so that we can do the right testing for workforce management and payroll. That's, that's what the underlying arrow down there in purple is that connects that GHR data preparation area to workforce management and payroll. So that's something we're watching and working on very closely. Okay. That is a dependency. Okay. The report well, sir. also mentioned that the, uh, that the financial team has a project management intern. Can I'm you, sorry, what was the statement again, sir? The, the, uh, the, the financial team added a project management intern? Yes. Can you 
Can you say a little bit about that and what, what role that person plays? Uh, that, that person is to help us with, uh, you know, he's a, he literally is an intern, came from uh, CSU, just graduated, as a matter of fact. Uh, his name is Raj. And uh, he's, been, he's been helping. He's, he fo his focus in uh, college was project management uh, along with IT. So he's been just helping out, sort of carrying water with it, doing everything from meeting notes to helping us maintain our SharePoint list to maintaining project plans, that kind of thing. So sort of administrative project management assistance. Okay. And do, do we have a comprehensive project management process in place for this, or, or have we not gotten that far? Well, when you say comprehensive project management process, um, what I assume you mean by that is a, a, pro a project management plan, a formal, uh, in, a, in a formal sense, okay, a, a formal way that we're tracking uh, activity lists both in the plan and activity lists that are a little more tactical outside of the plan, and that project team is acquainted with those lists and that they're reviewed on a regular basis, that we have structured meetings that, they, that we use to go through those lists, um, and that we have responsibilities assigned for those activities. I wouldn't say that we're perfect in all those areas, but I'd say that we have those tools in place. Okay. Please proceed. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this chart before we proceed? I have one, if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Only because you raised the importance of making sure that the purple WFM GHR data integrate is completed by July. So how high is that risk? Where are we in accomplishing that by the end of May? Or would it spill over to June, even that? I mean, right. where are you in your high, in your, why would you single that out as being something to watch? I, I single that out because I believe in that area, that's one of the highest risks we have, to answer your question. So, and I, when we, I'll, I, what I'd like to do is defer talking about that just a little bit. I have a risk slide as a very closing slide that. here, and okay. I'd like, I, I address it specifically there. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain this one item where there's the, uh, on the bottom of the page where there's a large purple arrow that goes from, from, Purple WFM to the red WFM. Yeah, that that that's the arrow that uh, I think uh, Councilwoman Baker was to. Councilwoman mm -hmm. Baker was referring to, and that's the one that that's getting data from GHR. There's a you know, GHR is mm -hmm. ultimately is the book of record for all employee data, including mm -hmm. data that gets uh, much of it that gets passed over to both payroll and workforce management. So, if that data is not there or if the data is not correct, then that affects the implementation of payroll and workforce management. That's why that arrow is there with that connection. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next, next slide just points out, uh, I'm not going to belabor this one because we've already talked about lots of pieces, but uh, in terms of the different things that we've gone through in the latest schedule for that, that got us to the 211 go live, for uh, general ledger, project accounting, and flexible budget. This is really the, the timeline with all the activities associated with that. So you can kind of see how that lays out. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but we had a, an overall project uh, percentage complete, program uh, percent complete of 48%. Uh, that, that was the lead slide for my section. Uh, the details by module with the progress by module, at least summarized by module at that level, are in this chart. Again, I don't want to take a deep dive into each individual module unless there's questions for this one. Okay. Just a comment that this is the first that we've seen this on a project-wide basis, and so... We appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Our goal was to try to make this more of a program view from this point forward. Okay. Thank yes, you. sir. Uh, same thing with this chart. This is the work breakdown structure. Again, extracted directly out of Microsoft Project. Um, 
and you can you can see the specific dates. While the other the other slide had the Gantt chart, this is a, just a, a different view of that. As you can see, it's organized around exactly the same go live blocks, if you will, month blocks that was on the very lead chart that we had, and the very same chart that I've been using all the way back to October when we first briefed it. Okay, so you can just see the details underneath each of those blocks and the percent complete that we currently report. Question? Okay. Uh, my last slide here is the uh, risk slide. Um, and just things that risk don't mean that they're, just because they're on the list doesn't mean they are going to happen, but it certainly means that at least in the case of these five things, they're things we're watching so that we can get early, provide early warning if, they, if it looks like they're, they become likely. Um, and so that you know that we're thinking about mitigation strategies for each one of these. So uh, the first one, and some of these I've already touched on, the April, May task, uh, you know, what if those things run longer? I already addressed that basically. You know, could we move uh, into the June time frame with that? Yeah, we could. Do we want to? No. <laughs> Um, May, June task, same thing. Could we move that out? Um, we could. We'd rather not, and we don't want to make that call right now. Payroll and WFM complexity, you know, just the fact that we have, uh, the number escapes you right now, something like 1,600 individual tests, is the one that we keep talking about, uh, uh, to run, and, that we, you know, if we run either late on that or find more defects than expected on that. Could, that. could that cause us a problem? Yes. And the statement behind that might be the most alarming for everybody, but I want to be in the, in the interest of being transparent and, and, and let you know what I'm thinking here. If more time is needed for testing and integration, then this could result in a move to a September cutover. So if I were you, and I was talking to Dennis about that this morning, okay, and and... Uh, the question on the table is how fast do we have to make that call if it looks like we don't have what we need, okay? And my answer to that, to Dennis, my answer to you and that question, anticipated question would be we, we need to make that call no later than the end of February, uh, earlier if we can, and we're looking very hard at all the factors that feed into that so that we can provide that decision no later than the end of February so that we know where we're going. Because that one does have an impact. We have not computed the financial impact to that at this point. Uh, you know, should we get, should it look like we need to make that call? Obviously, we'll be doing lots of math on that and have lots of discussion around that. And when are those currently scheduled for? Are those July 1 items? Those are, that's the July payroll workforce management set. Uh, so you're saying that could move to July, from July to September? If we had to move it. Uh, it, it, the most logical thing would be to move it a quarter, not a month, just because of the way payroll records are kept. You could move it a month. So it would actually it move to work. October 1. Sir, uh, on October 1, go live, in other words, another cut over and, into uh, September. What's your current probability on that? I'd rather not shoot from the hip. You know, there's an old saying that says, he who shoots from the hip shoots himself in the foot. I don't know. But, but, so I, all kidding aside, I, I would rather get a... a, a decent assessment on this. Uh, we're waiting. What we are doing uh, as part of that mitigation strategy right now, we're working through a complete plan of, you know, when exactly do we think we're going to have that data and is that going to cause us a problem? And also, uh, workforce management is right in the middle of, of, I mentioned the three iterations of testing that they're doing. They finished iteration one uh, and they're getting ready to start the next iteration of testing. And uh, we want to see the results of that. That's going to happen. That'll be in that data coming in over the next week or two. And once we get that data combined with the, the plan on, on exactly what it's going to take to get all the employee data in place, then I'll be able to answer that question. So, Can you, and, can you give me a ballpark on, on uh, what the increased cost would be of that change in schedule. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather, I, I really don't want to shoot from the hip because I haven't done the math on this in all, in all fairness. So um, not trying to dodge the question. I just don't have the answer right now. 
a lot of thought needs to go into that. You know, if we were to make that call, and as we put together that mitigation strategy, I will have the answer for that at some point. Well, well, as just, we put that together, if I could just finish this thought, sir, we, you know, we need to take into consideration if we were going to push it out that far, are there staff members that we would lay off and bring back? Are there, you know, what can we do to mitigate the, the cost expense here? Uh, there's just a lot of things we need to think through that we have not. I simply put it out here for you, not that it's going to happen, but that that is something that we're always cognizant of, and it's probably it's the biggest ticket item that we would move if we have of any of these things. It certainly would have by far the biggest impact. So, well, risking stating the obvious, there's uh, <clears throat> some things that. That happened, and it's not a real big deal. But this sounds like a highly visible event. If the, if this were it would be yes, to sir. occur, uh, okay. All right, I present it to you in the interest of being completely transparent about what we're working on. Um, the last risk there is always there, doing multiple things at the same time. Uh, it's been there from the beginning. It's still there. Uh, our staff is responding well to that. Uh, we try. Try not to overburden them by spreading out the, some of the some of the work in the way that we have here. So, I don't right. think you commented on the second last item: I integrating WFM, GHR, and payroll. It, it's I, I sort of combined that with the first one. It's it's all part of the same thing. If either of those things or both of them were to happen, that that would cause the push to the September time frame potentially. So okay, fine. Okay, okay. Chair, may okay. I ask a question? Other questions? Ms. Baker. Just to be clear, going back now, given you given your top risk, going back to your color time chart. Okay. Given that we take a look at the worst case scenario and we're looking at October 1 to go live instead of July, am I hearing that right? Yep. So if we happens, were to make that move, that would that would certainly be under discussion. Yes, ma'am. What happens to the rest of this chart, the August and then the September? Is that does that all? No. No. And I, and I was trying to make that point. Thank you for raising that question. Uh, those things are really unconnected, if you will, both from a staffing standpoint and from a project management standpoint. Uh, you know, it would not affect our our August timeframes. So our budget solution, all agency, 2020 budget. All that stuff, we, we, would, we would try to keep on track for, for August. It would not be affected by payroll. So, okay. so the September 2019, um, that would be maybe the last day of September, given that payroll we're talking about could possibly be October 1st. That would be the cutover would be literally would be a month end calendar well it's a pay period cut over actually be right, right around that time frame so yeah. that's so end of september is the drop dead date for all even though payroll may be pushed closer to that end well the the effect yes i think is the short answer to your question okay yes ma'am that's what it looks like i'm just asking okay yeah okay all right thank you Other questions? and that is because it's unaffected by payroll that's the that's the reason why we can delay one big piece because it's not affecting the other pieces. That that Better. is not affecting the other pieces. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Other question? I would uh, also just mention about uh, how messy the twenty to twenty one budget is going to be in 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 the best of all possible world because of the financial issues that we're dealing with without having uh, having ERP problems to further gum it up so I I uh, yes, I'm just I'm just pleading that Maggie gets what she needs when she needs it so so that she, that she can do the budget so am I okay that's that's high she, on she mentioned it to me once or twice I <laughs> <laughs> That's high on my radar screen too. So I'm yes, sir. I mentioned I'm mentioning it. It isn't the first time I've mentioned it, and I don't think it'll be the last. Okay. Okay. That's all that I have today. Okay. That was a lot. Right. Thank. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Okay.
Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kiran Vasudevan. Uh, I'm from Department of IT. Um, I'm the program manager and working with the HR modules uh, in Enforce. So I'll just go over some of the work that we have done so far. Um, so first up is some of the HR team wins. Um, as you know, we did the open enrollment in the new Infor uh, system. We had an acceptance or employee participation of 99.6%. So what that means is that's the number of employees in the county who actually went into the Infor system to do their open enrollment. And you know, we've asked our Infor partners, and they agree that you know that's a, a significantly high number. And this is just one line, but it's uh, the, the back end work that went into it, all the work that the HR team did, the IT team did, uh, the open enrollment workshops. We also had change agents who were talking about the new system, the benefits of the new system. So all that, it, it, this, this, this single line kind of caps it up that, you know, uh, the adoption from the county to go and do the open enrollment, then that worked out very well for us. Um, also, when we launched um, the new MyHR to do the benefits, we also um, introduced a new technology that will allow county employees to log into the ERP system. So if you're sitting in a computer, you log in. If you have a computer, it lets you into the ERP system directly. Um, so that's technology that we have to uh, put in place. So uh, this open enrollment system is also used by all the courts, um, the Board of Elections, and some of the other non-executive agencies also. So we have to do some IT technology partnership with those courts and agencies to make sure their employees can get into the new system. Um, so that's also a, a lot of work done by the Department of IT uh, at, at the county and also the other departments to make sure all that can happen seamlessly. Uh, so a lot of work went in uh, to make all of that possible. Um, after we did the open enrollment, the next step is to send that information to the benefit vendors. So uh, if an employee goes to, has a medical appointment in the first week of January or second week of January, they should be in the system, be able to look up the benefit information to the dental uh, um, uh, benefits and so on and so forth. So that's some of the integration work where we take that information on the plans that the employees elected and send it to our benefit carriers. Uh, so that's some work that we completed also. These Again, last year we used SAP. This year all that happened through the Infor application. So that's some of the, um, the challenging work that was completed. Um, another uh, a uh, big aspect that we completed is uh, the talent acquisition portal. It's essentially the job portal where uh, county employees or new candidates will apply for county jobs. Now, this is an integrated enforced solution. We'll show you a demo of that uh, in a little bit. But this is, so we have two portals now. One is internal, where you can do an internal job posting, and an external job posting is integrated to the Infor platform where you know, candidates can apply for jobs and you know, managers can go in there and uh, you know, look at the candidates and rate the candidates, rank the candidates, so on and so forth. So this is live today. This is benefiting the county today. So this is all technology that's in place. Um, the last bullet, um, I have another statistic over there. So as of Thursday, we had about 1,200 candidates apply for about 100 job openings. And we looked at it this morning. We already had, added more job openings and we had more candidates apply for this. Um, the last part, last line I have there is uh, another technology called the knowledge base solution. Uh, we'll show you that solution in a little bit in a demo um, that shows what it is, how it's going to benefit the county. So that was soft launch towards the end of uh, December. It's a soft launch there. It means that, you know, select group in HR and IT have access to the system. Uh, the building is done. We're just, you know, making sure that it's correctly configured before we release it to all employees to be used. Um, so we'll go through. Uh, a demo of that solution also in a little bit. Before I move to the next slide, any questions? Yes. Um, with the open enrollment, yeah. what were there any issues um, with the data? Can you share some of those with us? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. We had some issues with data in terms of uh, how employees would enter the information. So uh, you can put a one and a half street or one and a quarter street. So all that became an issue for us because you know, when you send that file to the vendor, you know, the vendor says this is not a valid address. So we had to do a lot of cleanup over there. Uh, it's a new technology solution. We, we, we had um, like a parent and a child employed in the county. So they were on each of those dependents. The system threw out a lot of errors that way. Um, also, when we send this information to the vendors, you know, we send them a file. It's a technical implementation. The vendor accepts the file. Uh, so a lot of work went into There's a lot of cleanup uh, that had to occur. We also had to um, have close to 6,800 employees go into the system and enter the information. 
6,800, I believe, is the number. So making sure you know they can get into it correctly. Uh, if there's a new employee, he has to be he she has to be set up in the system to do the open enrollment. So definitely a lot of challenges. It was we had a war room set up. We had folks on the phone continuously answering, helping people. Uh, the HR team did a really good job where they had a lot of analysts, HR analysts in the buildings helping um, the employees, and then we would take the back office calls and go go help them as well. So yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, Ms. Baker. Uh, yes, looking at the last report we received um, on the same topic for yeah. the job portals, yeah. there were um, posted 67 job openings and 676 applications. So now we're um, a month later, and we're looking at 1,200 applications for 100 job openings. Correct. How, First of all, um, does the job openings continue to increase? And yes. secondly, have we hired from this list um, that we are taking applications? Uh, the hiring portion, I'm not sure yet, um, but I, we can give that information back to you. But uh, this is a live system, so if there's a new direct position or an opening, it, it goes there live. It happens real time. Yeah. So if I may, so it went from a, just within a month, 67 job openings to 100 job openings. Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay. And do we? How can we get that information of the, of the twelve hundred that applied? If we were able to fulfill those one hundred job openings, mm -hmm. you can get that for yeah, us. Yeah, we or? can get that for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a note here. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, kind of the summary of the wins that all the activities that was done uh, so far. The next screen shows some of the activities planned for the, the rest of the year. So number one is uh, the dual entry system. We have SAP and uh, the Infor GHR system, and SAP is required because it's a key part of payroll. Till we are on the Infor payroll system, we have to have SAP in the middle there. So right now we're doing the dual entry where you know uh, information is being entered in both systems uh, to make sure paychecks are correct, and you know we have the benefits in GHR. What we are looking to do, uh, do now is to automate that. Um, so have some kind of a technological solution in place that can take away some of the dual entry process so we can you know, keep the systems in sync much more faster uh, and more accurately. That's something we're looking to do fairly um, uh, in, in the short time frame. The second note is, you know, Jack discussed earlier, it's related to the new information that we need to have in the GHR or the HR module to support uh, the, time, uh, the timekeeping system, which is WFM, and payroll. So what we did so far is put in the information to do open enrollment and benefits, and now we're kind of gearing the system to, you know, to sync up with the timekeeping system and payroll. Uh, that's something that we are actively uh, doing. Uh, the organization and the supervisor structure, we're also revamping that, how it is in Infor system, to the way we want it to be. When we got it from SAP, it was uh, it kind of closely resembled to what the SAP system was because we know we, we had to keep both systems in play. And now we're kind of looking at what the future uh, organization structure should be and how it, how it specifically sp plays with the timekeeping uh, solution. Uh, we're also uh, going to launch, as I mentioned earlier, the knowledge base module to all county employees. Uh, we're targeting end of February for all county employees to start using. And uh, the last mm -hmm. bullet there is the two of the modules that are coming up soon. is the learning management system and the talent management system. So the learning management is where uh, the county employee county team will uh, put courses there where employees can uh, take those courses. Uh, it could be a course could be like how to use the HR system will be a course there. Some of the ethics training will be there. And the talent management management is the employee performance uh, management of that and the succession planning and some of those uh, HR type um, activities. So any questions on this slide? Okay, may please I, continue. May I just chair? Yeah. And I'm sorry to ask yeah. on a previous slide, only because it was asked previously yeah. and we were answered back. Is there any way that you can segregate the employee submissions from the general public submissions when it comes to the amount of job openings that there are, just to know where our employees are at and where we are getting applications from the outside? Sure. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we'll have a dashboard that shows exactly how people are applying. Uh, by each requisition, it says you know where they're getting applying it from. So we'll show the graphic. We'll You're able to do that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, Chair. Thanks. 
I already saw some information on this, and only about 25% of the applications are coming off the website. They're, they're coming off of, off of things like Indeed and other job portals and stuff. So, so, uh, so we're, getting, we're getting applicants from a variety of sources. It's good to know. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, please continue. Okay. Um, this is like the high level uh, rollout schedule. Uh, the four top four lines in gray, those are the ones that's already completed. And like I mentioned earlier, we have some more portion of uh, the HR service delivery coming up, and then learning management and talent management. Um, these are also key modules, but if you look at you know what else we're delivering, like the finance and the payroll and, and the timekeeping modules, you know, those are more uh, important ones for us to de deliver. But these are the other modules that we have in, in scope for this, um, um, for the HR module. Okay. And why is the HRSD uh, so much later than yeah. the other items? That's a good question. So that part of HRSD um, has a component to payroll. It uh, picks up some information from the, pay from the actual payroll generation to uh, provide employees some information on their paychecks. Um, it's called uh, Total Rewards, that module is called. So that needs payroll to be in a significant state of design and, and set up before that can even begin. So that's why it starts later. So what does Total Rewards consist of? Um, I can probably give you more information later on, but it, it, it tells an employee, you know, uh, based on you know, how their paycheck is set up and how the benefits that they're getting from the county. Uh, yeah. So would it include everything like their health care and their sit time? and, their, and the, Is that what we're talking about? Maybe components of that and, and some other also. And uh, if, if the payroll is delayed to an October 1 start, as we heard previously discussed, does that mean this item would even be later than the 8-1 go live that's projected? Correct. This has to come uh, kind of with that or a little bit after that. So that's yeah. dependent on payroll. Right. Okay. It, it's also a small fringe type module. If you know we don't have that functionality today, it's a you know, but it'll come after that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Other questions. Okay. Okay. Please we're gonna, proceed. Yeah, we're going to go into two demos. The first one is going to be a knowledge base. And the demos have to be really brief okay. because we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, we have. Uh, Director of Benet Hollywood's doing the demo, and let me just switch over. We have it queued up, and uh... hi, Hollywood's Director of HR for Benefits and Compensation. So, as Kieran mentioned, this is the HRSD that we um, soft launched. HRSD has two components knowledge base and HR case management. Essentially, this HRSD will take over um, the current, the old MyHR page where people do their time and attendance, where they view their paycheck information, um, where they view policies, procedures, a lot of our benefit information. In addition, that case management piece is now handled through emails. So we have an email line and benefits. If any employees have questions, they send an email. Same thing with payroll, um, time and attendance, other areas. That will all be handled through this portal when it's fully launched. So this page right here um, had a lot of setup that needed to be done. One of the questions about the delay, the teams that are implementing other portions of the HR modules are in charge of implementing this as well, which is why we did a soft launch before the full implementation. So starting in the end of February, when employees log into the Enforce system, this is what they'll come to as their homepage. And they can see anything here from reviewing their benefit information, uh, employee links, looking at job opportunities, reviewing their benefit status, even going in and making changes to their benefits. Um, clicking on a life event saying I added I need to add my child I need to add a spouse things like that and then once payroll goes live they'll be able to view their pay information and other information out here as well your question about total rewards that will show employees essentially like a total compensation statement where you can look and see what your total comp is that you receive so vacation sick time uh, your benefit costs your 
uh, salary kind of all added together so you can get a whole glimpse of your of your total compensation package. Will people be able to change their tax withholding on this? There will be through one of these um, areas they will be able to change their tax withholding, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eliminating forms, essentially, they'll be able to do it electronically. Questions, Ms. Conwell. <clears throat> to the chair, to Ms. Holly, does it include <clears throat> this new page? Does it include everything that came from the other plus more, or is it has it left out anything? It so right now it's left out some things just because they aren't live. So when we go live with this in the end of February, employees of course can't do some of their payroll related items. Um, so this right now is tailored to what we have live, and then we have the ability to add things as we go go live with adi additional portions of the system. I mean the finished product. The finished product will include all of the stuff that they were used to on the MyHR page. Or I, I believe so. I don't okay. believe there will be any gaps. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, so employees can log in today. They can see their current benefits. It can go in and show them all the amounts that they pay for the different benefit packages. This is the HR case management piece. So for example, if you had a question about um, anything from uh, your benefit package or something's wrong, you would go in here, select your area, select the topic that you're questioning, submit your question, and it would come directly to an HR staff and we can respond it and it will be tracked through this, this HR case management piece. It's a very nice feature. Today we use email, which is not very easy to use when you're trying to look at metrics and tracking and ensuring that you've responded to everything. This portal will actually be able to show us response times, categories of questions, and really be able to uh, track metrics without having to do it separately outside of a system. Will it show your, you guys response back? It will. It, track it will track history. So if we needed to go back and see how things were responded to in timeliness, it all of it's saved there. It's a very nice feature of the system. In addition, managers over these areas can go out here and see things can be escalated. And it, again, it's just a really nice tracking system, which we don't have today. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, this is just the functionality that we have today. Once payroll's live, employees could go out here under leaves and time off and actually request time off or look at their time balances. You'll see there's no links for that here today. That some of this is just general information, but we'll continue to build on this as additional things go live. Um, the biggest part right now today, um, we have built all of our benefit plan documents out here. So you can go and find forms, you can look up your dental benefits. Uh, once this goes live, it will replace our benefits website. Um, and again, it's, it's accessible anywhere inside or outside of the county. And that's really all I have um, for the HRSD piece, if anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Demo number two. Very quick demo number two for you. Jonathan Zarula, Human Resources. So I wanted to show you three parts relating to the talent acquisition piece of the system. So I wanted to show you um, our external job board, our internal job board, and a little bit of our dashboard and metrics. And also I believe the question was asked earlier if we've hired anybody off of this system. Fired off a question real quick to our recruiters. And I'm aware at this point I got one response back, at least one position. There may be additional ones, but at least one that we've hired off of this system since we've gone live. So this is a quick look at the external job board that's right now live on our site. So you can see all the positions that we currently have posted. So a total of 21 different jobs listed. Folks can scroll through. One of the nice changes with this system is there's now some opportunity to be able to search. So you see over here you can search by keyword, location, category. So that's all the different kinds of positions that we have. And those are all new features for our external job candidates. They can click on any of these positions and get a full description of the position, and they'll be able to apply directly through our website. This is the same thing, but on the internal version, right, and it's a little bit bigger for us. So again, this is now the first time that we have a truly internal job board for our current employees to be able to look at and access, uh, and that helps us to reduce some confusion with folks who were external candidates but might have seen a posting in the past that said, open to internal candidates only. They didn't see that and were applying for some of our positions. So this is a nice benefit, but again, it contains very similar information as what is available to our external candidates. 
And then the last piece I just want to show you real quick, there was a question about metrics. And so all that information is tracked in the system. Oh, and evidently it scrolled away for me. So let me pull it up real quick for you. Now, I'm not going to waste time in, in the meeting today, um, but we will make sure that we get you that information so that you can see those metrics. Um, any questions for me before I step away? I just wanted to know, when you're searching for a job, does it also connect to our PRC to let them know if there's any testing or anything that's needed for that position? So each of those position descriptions, when you click on it, will contain a full set of information about the position, including wording that we have written out in conjunction with the PRC about how the testing process for the position works. So whether it's an unclassified position, which is reviewed by human resources with the hiring department, or if it's classified competitive, which means there's testing and some information about that, or classified non-competitive, which means there's no testing, but just qualifications review. So again, we worked with the PRC, and there's information in each of those postings that helps the applicant to understand what they should be expecting. Who's taking that information off as the positions are filled? How does that Excuse me, Ms. Keys, speak into the microphone. Sorry about that. <laughs> How does the jobs come off if, once they're filled? Sure. So the, the system is smart. So when we post the syst uh, a job in the system right now, we can give it a time frame when we want that position to close. So we can say we want it posted for two weeks and then come down. We can tell it we want to post it internally and externally. We can post it for shorter. We can post it for longer. And we have the ability to be able to update that if, as we're looking at the candidate pool, we decide that we like some more time to be able to build a stronger pool. So all of that can be controlled within, from within the system and preset it and then be able to edit it as needed. Okay, thank you. One more. Just to follow up on Councilwoman Conwell's question, um, I, I, I'm just a little unclear. I know you're, you indicated that the system is smart. However, once the position is actually filled, are you saying that that goes back into HR administration's hand, or does the PRC also have a um, decision-making component in pulling that down? If that Does that kind of speak a little more to your question, Councilwoman Conwell? I can briefly say Turned off my own microphone. Um, the PRC and HR work very closely, so we work together on the development and testing of the system, and the PRC shares access to the system with us. So for example, on a PRC classified tested position, when the posting comes down, the PRC automatically has access to the requisition behind the scenes. I'd be happy to show you that stuff maybe offline because there's no way to not see uh, you know, private candidate information. But they're able to immediately look, see if candidates are qualified, use that to drive testing and the eligibility list, and then HR can work with them on the candidates that they determine are qualified. So they share the access to the system with us. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. We're trying. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> my name is Janelle Green. I'm from the Department of IT. I'm going to uh, briefly touch on um, the ERP budget. So firstly, I would like to state that we I do work with <coughs> OBM on a monthly basis to review the expenses from the prior month. And um, we do that. We have gone and done that for the last uh, few months and are, have plans to do that moving forward. So um, just... The slide show will show um, just snippets from the full sheet, one sheeter that we, we do distribute to uh, the finance committee. So uh, the first part of the finances is reviewing the consulting services that we have in the, in the ERP project. Um, so looking at the first lines is the in for professional services amount. Um, that is inclusive of the $3.2 million amendment um, that we did uh, get passed a few months ago. Um, 
it, it, uh, as I said, it incorporates a $3.2 million amendment, um, and it factors in um, the actuals plus the budgeted amount going forward. Um, RSM, uh, it shows the current amount of $515,000. There will be an upcoming um, amendment for $30,000 uh, for their third-party assurances for um, going forward for uh, the project. Um, the other miscellaneous um, contracts are for uh, various services. Uh, Plant Moran was for some fiscal um, legacy systems work, um, and uh, Fred Lombardo did some work with Public Works to roll out the uh, EAM project. And some what we term as miscellaneous contracts were items that were paid um, prior to um, our the IT um, changeover from the change in leadership, um, some miscellaneous contracts that were paid out. Were there any questions about this particular section? Let's try to complete all the sections and then we'll take right, questions. We'll okay. So the next section is for um, backfill support. That is largely comprised of our main sale uh, contract. The first part in the blue was indicative of the part that was included in the, um, the as part of the N4 contract. Uh, Main so was a, a small business partner um, that they selected to do uh, some of the deliverables. And so that uh, $674,000 is for all of the work that the, the contractors did under the N4 portion of the contract. The second line is for main sale direct. Um, those are some the estimate estimates for and the actual costs for uh, the staff augmentation services that they provide directly to us. Uh, so we do keep a, um, a spreadsheet of we track by resource. So it, each individual contractor, how much we estimate um, that contractor's time uh, would cost. And we look at it through from um, the start of that contract, which was September 17th through the end of the end of the uh, the contract, which is uh, the end of September. Also on this um, this slide is uh, quick employment, which is uh, the temporary uh, HR backfill. Um, that service hasn't really been utilized very much um, on a very minimal basis. So that includes some actual costs plus uh, estimates moving forward. And again, miscellaneous line encompasses um, expenses paid uh, prior to uh, 2018. And um, the technical um, section of the budget, we have technical development consulting and the technical data warehouse. So DWR and Unify so SAP support are two of our uh, contractors that support the legacy systems. DWR supports um, Famous and Unify supports, again, the um, SAP. So those are expenses relating to um, the migration of data uh, into the ERP system. And uh, the second section, the data warehouse, um, we were able to contract with Solix for the data lake services. So uh, the $450,000 is the amount uh, for the, uh, for the two-year contract for, um, uh, for those services for the data lake. And um, we are processing an amendment for $100,000 for the Navigator uh, Enterprise Data Architecture. Uh, they have been instrumental in helping us plan out how we're going to um, uh, migrate some of the data and how we can work all of that into the ERP. And so we look for their partnership to move forward. Uh, the next slide is uh, showing the software and hardware costs. So a lot of these are the in, the N4 annual, annual costs. So we have the 2017 cost. We have uh, the 2018 and 2019. Uh, 2018, uh, which is an invoice we received in December, um, is actually for uh, $1.4 uh, million dollars instead of the 1.5. So we'll see some um, cost savings there. And uh, $300,000 um, that we expect to spend out of the ERP budget at the end of the, uh, going towards the end of the year. And um, the IT department will pick up the other amount, the approximately $1.2 million out of our operational budget. Uh, also included here is MHC, an emphasis that provides some software that works um, in tandem with the ERP, uh, the ERP uh, system. Uh, those are in the fiscal area. And uh, we have the EAM system. Uh, those, we, I included those costs in there because we haven't paid that invoice yet for the, uh, the licenses for uh, 77000 And again, uh, miscellaneous costs um, that include some um, uh, prior to 2018 spend. Also factored here at the bottom, $288,000 for hardware. Uh, that could be the uh, time clocks, 
um, the time clocks for the um, WFM modules and other hardware we may need to do to keep, uh, to have um, the, the ERP system operational. On this slide is the ERP uh, core program team. This is for uh, the actual um, employees that are dedicated strictly to the ERP uh, system. Uh, we currently have seven FTE on staff. Uh, we have uh, four information system and systems analyst po positions posted, and we have one project manager that started today uh, that is factored in the, into this budget. And uh, lastly, we have the totals page. Um, we have, with actuals and forecasts so far, um, we have uh, over $24 million uh, either uh, forecasted or encumbered. And right now we have what we call, what is here listed as contingency, but we call it um, unencumbered funds of a, a, about $933,000. We heard earlier today that that the installation is essentially complete in public works. Correct. And and my question is: uh, Is any work that's being done going forward in public works being being uh, paid out of IT, out of the operating budget, as opposed to being paid from the installation budget? In terms of licenses, no. Um, we have the $77,000 from when we originally entered into um, um, the agreement. We haven't paid that invoice yet. Um, we have it slated and broken down between, I believe, five index codes for public works to pay for the EAM systems licenses um, out of their budget and not out of ERP. We developed a new uh, payment system Instead of invoicing each item individually, we've, we're, we're doing it on, on a monthly basis. Have we completed any of those monthly invoices and, and reviewed and paid them so far? So yes, um, to touch on that, uh, we've, got, we've received the November and December um, invoices that we have in process right now. I believe they're in Dennis's queue to be signed. And what we do for those invoices, we have a list of all the deliverables that are scheduled to be a part of that invoice. And we have each of the project team leads go and review each of the deliverable, deliverables excuse me, to make sure that that item is complete and sign off before we send down the invoice for payment. So uh, that would be Kieran, that would be Jack. Um, and also Mike Young looks at all the invoices before we send them down and making sure that uh, those deliverables are complete and that we send them down for processing. And were they complete for November and December? Yes. But they have not yet been paid, is that correct? That is correct. When do you expect them to be paid? As soon as we get them back from the fiscal office. How he long? To, uh, he has to sign off on them before we, before we. Uh, Quick correction, sorry. They've just been vouchered today, so everyone signed off on them. Now they're going to get vouchered and then go down and finish the, finish the processing out. So then by the end of this week, they'll be paid out. Other questions, uh, uh, Ms. Baker? Thank you, Chair. Are we able at this time, uh, finding that we are launching and we have dates to launch, and that way when something is being launched, that means that the operating of that system is now being done without capital dollars. Can we, if asked, be able to answer what are hard capital dollars and what are operating dollars, even as they are still within the scope of the $25 million? Um, that we left in the purview under the... Um under Dennis Kennedy. Um, he, I know he's working with auditors, both internal and external, to determine what would be factored as a, a capital cost versus operational. So at this time, I would not be able to answer that. But that is being looked at? Yes, it is. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Gallagher. You had a notation on Plant Moran uh, in your presentation. What was that about? Um, I just notated that that was something for the, uh, it was a fiscal uh, service that was looking at um, some of the legacy audit work from when they were, were there was a contract that they entered into um, with Plant Moran in 2018 for approximately $90,000 uh, for fiscal. So we're, they're still, we're still doing business with them after the recovery? We, we have not um, 
we have not received any of the invoices from them. So I, I assume not. I send a note over to the fiscal office asking if this contract is canceled. What's the next um, move for this contract? I have not yet received a response on that. You probably should contact the prosecutor on that one. I would. Well, fair enough. Uh, and for future, I think it'd be a little bit less disjointed if uh, I think OBM should be given this presentation on the finances of this, of this IT project. I'd feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. The last report I saw had the uh, the unencumbered expenses or or contingency at eight hundred and fifty, and now it's nine thirty three. Where was that? It was additional eighty three. So, 83,000 identified. So as we have not um, made hires, uh, so um, we haven't um, locked in uh, people and workers for the information systems analysts, um, and, and several of those positions are still open. Uh, we budgeted them into our, our plans, but we haven't made those hires. So as we don't hire, those plans move to being unencumbered because we don't have any uh, costs associated with that. Uh, what are the principal risks that you're aware of of things that might require use of some some or all of that eight nine hundred and thirty three thousand and and what amounts? Um, as far as what I know at this time, I do not have any of that information. I get the information from the project leads, and we work that into the budget. Um, from what I know, um, we're still working within the twenty five million dollars. Questions. That was my question. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, through the chair. Um, so I was, I want to say this couple slides back where you had the little change boxes and the, and the money amounts in there. So that was my question if, yeah, if they, if, obviously it's an increase, but are they falling in within the budget um, that we initially set or are we? They're still within the budget. Okay, so we haven't moved anywhere towards contingency funds at this point. Well, um, we call it unencumbered funds. So right now we're still within um, the original amount for the contingency funds, whereas in the the 2016 budget was about 3.3 million. Uh, right now we're sitting at 933,000. So they're unencumbered funds as we call them right now. So uh, I say we've already dipped into the contingency funds, uh, particularly with the amendment that we that we had going for the N4. Um, professional services portion. Um, and why did we dip? Is that due to I mean just from the comparison from the comparison former. of oh, okay. of what the, the funds from the original budget to where we are now. Okay. I I would point out though as a positive note that when when we did the uh, change order and we had to put more money into the in for contract at that time the uh, Contingency subsequent to that event stood at eight hundred thousand, and and we've now now gone for uh, for three months, I th approximately that it's been since that happened, and we've gone gone from eight hundred thousand to nine hundred and thirty three thousand, moving in a positive direction. So so uh, so for the last. Uh, for the last three months, there has not been there has not been a net draw on that contingency. It in fact has grown a little bit. So, uh, so uh, right now, at this moment, we're in a positive trend in terms of the uh, the fund management. Yes, at this time. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have. You have a little no, more? No, 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 no. This is I, just to close it out. I know you appreciate I have a couple patience. questions for you. It's good sure, that you came right. up here. There, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's, there's been these uh, repeated things coming from audit and elsewhere that, that, uh, that the county's IT system itself needs to have a disaster planning system in place. Have we made any progress in moving toward that? Well, when you look at the ERP system in and of itself, it's designed for built-in disaster recovery. It's housed in the cloud into Amazon and is a backup facility as well. So if the primary site goes down, excuse me, the primary site goes down, it'll automatically fail over to the backup site. So as part of ERP, all of our legacy systems that did not have a disaster recovery plan 
automatically have one as part of the contract. And, it's, and it has been vetted out by um, internal audit. They have looked at our SOC 1 reports and everything that came out of um, Infor and Amazon. And uh, have we made pro progress on, on replacing the services that we lost when, uh, when Jim Hay left us? It, the, 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 system, the position's posted. It's been out on the national websites. And after the talent acquisition came up, it's been internal to here. I got a phone call from HR this morning that said they had some applicants that they wanted me to take a look at. How much, that's been a couple months now. Uh, how much is it, how much is that hurting us? Uh, as soon as uh, Jim left the organization, we restructured the responsibilities, any of the responsibilities that he had. So uh, I don't believe it's impacted us at all. Uh, the reports I received from Infor were, were agreed with that assessment that um, after he left, we quickly re 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 rewrited the ship and we've been moving along perfectly fine. The other items that Jim was responsible for is where we're feeling most of the impact for the, pro the not ERP related projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, you were gonna make a few closing statements. No, that was it. Was just come up because I know you're short on time. I was just gonna thank everybody because I know it was a lot of information because we've had a lot of things that transpired since the last quarter. And if you had any other additional questions, any other questions? Hearing none, we've covered a lot, and I would cordially invite everyone to uh, come back on Thursday morning at 10 a.m. for our session with. Z Zig Bursons, and I'm sure that he will provide us some additional enlightenment on these things. Uh, we've we've learned a lot today, uh, particularly about the uh, possible three-month delay in the payroll implementation, which is disconcerting and hopefully not going to be necessary. But mm -hmm. we will stay tuned. Okay. okay. Right, thank thank you, you very much. Any miscellaneous business? Hearing none, we are adjourned with about four minutes to spare. <laughs>